In Australia, the per capita is, is the worst uh, emitter of, of, carbon, of carbon gases. Yet you have got measures uh, in place to try to counteract that. A recent law uh, passed in Australia. Uh, explain that to me. Tell me a little, okay. little about that. Well, well, you've started off with a, a very you know, damning moral judgment. We're the worst. But uh, I think what you'll see now is that we've got this, uh, this new legislation through, which is, I think, probably amongst the best of this kind of legislation in developed countries. And it's, um, it's a comprehensive package which will serve to reduce carbon emissions over time well into the future and it's a comprehensive economic reform which starts off with putting a price on carbon floor and ceiling which in three years time will transit to being a fully fledged emissions trading scheme linked to others globally and uh, to make that package to give it some momentum and get it underway and well established in the Australian economy it comes with tax cuts to households and individuals and it comes with a massive new investment in renewable technologies, um, a whole lot of um, a whole lot of assistance to industry to help them make the transition, and we see this as being a very significant contribution to uh, to global efforts on well, also the the optics of it. You know, a country like Australia, which is a very intense resource-based economy. It's not, it's not nothing to turn it round. And if Australia can do it, and it's been a very hot, hotly contested political issue in Australia, uh, it's, it's, a good, it, it's a good encouragement to others who are equally trying. Basically, the, the, wor the 500 worst polluters will, will be taxed. Is that, is that the way it'll work? There you go saying worst again. Yeah. It's a characterisation. You know, the, 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 this has been the character of Australia's economy. And uh, so uh, this, is, this is a characteristic of our economy. And these people will be encouraged, these companies will be encouraged to transition to a much lower emission pathway. Australia is also vulnerable to the effects of climate change. You've suffered droughts uh, in, in recent recent years. Uh, you're also very close to the, the South Pacific Islands, which are most vulnerable to rising sea levels. Uh, do you feel you have a, a greater responsibility, or do you feel you know you feel the, the oh, impact uh, of the effects of climate change? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we're, we've got this sort of haunting sensation that we'll all be crispy critters by the end of the decade. You know, that the, the temperature the temperature issues are very strong in Australia. Um, increasing heat, increasing salination. Um, um, increasing uh, ocean warmth. Um, Australia is a you know, remarkably biodiverse and beautiful country that is already experiencing the effects of climate change, particularly in issues like water. And some of our most sort of forward-leaning government policies have been um, put together to take these issues on and make a future in a, com a climate compromised environment. So yes, and we're very, very aware of the effects um, um, of climate change in the region generally. You know, we work so closely as a, as a country and a government with uh, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea and the other um, Pacific Island countries in our region and of course New Zealand. And we're very aware of the effect that these changes to the climate will have on them. We've, we've all seen the trend in, uh, you know, these dramatic weather events that bring, you know, catastrophic um, consequences to families and homes and communities. And we're very aware of this. And it's, it's central to the way we think about climate change in Australia. Is there a healthy, vibrant debate in Australia about climate change, incorporating all sectors of society, young people, uh, industrial groups? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you know anything about Australia, you'll know there's always a healthy, robust debate debate that covers the spectrum <laughs> and climate change is no exception and uh, we've had um, groups of people in Australia and the head of our climate change authority um, uh, giving public forums you know we've had town hall lectures town hall discussions we've drawn out public opinion absolutely everywhere uh, it, it, there are different demo views that are oddly enough very strongly crystallized in demographics um, and the, you know, there are positive and negative ends of the spectrum. We've got skeptics, we've got wonderful grandmothers, we've got very interested young women and young people generally. And uh, no, no, it's, there's a very interesting demographic trends in the views on it, but it has been a richly vibrant debate. Mark my word. What does Australia bring to the debate, the climate change debate here at COP17? I mean, in relation to Kyoto, in relation to alternatives mm. to the Kyoto Protocols, where, where does Australia stand? Well, we would like more than anything to be able to be part of a group or a coalition across regional groups that could deliver the future framework. The Kyoto framework has been very successful in its way 
in the past. It crystallised a point in time in the early 90s um, between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1. That is almost nostalgia now. That group of Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 countries is so sort of massively dated as to be you know, much reduced in its effectiveness for climate action. A future framework has to have the major emitters in it. Um, as things stand now with the Kyoto Protocol, there's every likelihood that it will only capture about 17% of emissions going forward. Whereas the pledges um, uh, listed under the Copenhagen Accord and the Cancun Agreements do massively more, about 80%. And it seems to us that the future resides in how we deal with that 80% of emitters. And there, there is a sort of top 20 that absolutely fundamentally must be in a regime going forward. Now that means necessarily that the regime won't be the perfect global legally binding treaty that we all dream of this week. <laughs> it can't happen. But over time we can establish building blocks across the range of issues, mitigation, adaptation, clarification, uh, finance, um, forests, technology, all of which will be uh, ha have a, de a deep effect in being able to change things um, as we go forward. And those are the, ultimately what I would think of as the building blocks for a future regime. But, but a binding agreement? Oh, uh, well, look, it, it's very difficult to talk binding because when you look at the fine print, none of the major emitters are up for a kind of legally binding thing in the way we talk about. But there are degrees of bindingness. There's COP decisions. There's domestic legislation. I would think, personally, that in a world where you're looking for an overarching, legally binding, um, an agreement that has countries in a vice-like grip, it absolutely has to start with domestic legislation. It's a combination of domestic um, intention and of course you, get a, you, you can bring it together very well in an overarching sense if you have something multilateral. But it has to start with domestic governments, national governments acting in good faith and doing what they said they do, having mechanisms in place, legislative mechanisms in place to make it happen. And this is why we're very proud of this development in Australia because this is an absolute absolute commitment, it's in law, it will happen. And many countries are doing this now. I mean, the Chinese five-year plan, for example, has some quite, uh, you know, some very, very interesting shifts in, in carbon patterns in a, in a good way. And I would say that a, a, a Chinese five-year plan is a pretty binding thing on our planet. Um, in, and I think you'll see the EU, of course, does. Many countries are experimenting with their own domestic legislation either as a sort of whole of government thing or deeply vertical. There's all sorts of ways of, you know, skinning this cat. And it does depend on good faith, well-delivered, utterly transparent domestic action. I mean, are we going back a step? Are we, are we replacing Kyoto with something else? Are we starting again from the beginning? You can be as nasty as you like to me. I, I can't stand that cadaverous talk about Kyoto. Um, whatever we have in the future will be richly dependent on the scientific knowledge and the governance and the technical capacity and the, you know, just sheer volume of information we've collected in the course of Kyoto. So it will embody Kyoto in one way or another going forward. But we have to have something that is bigger than Kyoto and more suited to our times. You know, the treaties are uh, treaties are creatures of their time. They're creatures of what you c which governments you can line up. There's no way we can line up the top ten emitters right now and sign them up to something like Kyoto. So we have to be imaginative and forward-looking. And instead of talking about the death of one regime, which in some ways. Um, without grown, we have to talk about the, this, this, uh, this richness, this, um, the building blocks of this hybrid landscape that we're heading into. But the most important thing is that it's uh, based on strong domestic action by countries in a way that they can deliver their targets um, in good faith, with transparency, convincingly, talk about it and do it. Well, I admire your optimism, but I still, <laughs> I still worry, I think many people worry that it's not going to be enough and it's not going to be fast enough. Well, we have to do our best.